Good morning, everyone. What a joy uh, uh, to worship together in this manner, isn't it? As one church under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And really happy to see all of you. I see 72 screens, but I think there are more than that. Uh, it's really a joy uh, to see all of you who uh, tune in today. And my hope is that the Holy Spirit will continue to bless and encourage your heart as we continue right now uh, our time together by listening to today's message. Thanks uh, once again to Kevin for choosing those songs. Uh, I would say really prepares our heart to what the Lord has in store for us this morning. None of us are immune to trials and tragedies in life. That we all, all know, right? In fact, it is even more apparent today with the COVID situation. But here's something that we might struggle even more, and that is this. Sometimes we go through trials because we are followers of Christ. You heard me correctly. Sometimes we go through trials because we are followers of Christ. And when that happens, a lot of things seem to make no sense or little sense. Why? Well, because the God we worship is the God who is what? Sovereign, all-powerful, and all-good, isn't it? And so if that if that is the God we worship, if that is the God we believe, question is, why does he allow trials and tragedies in the lives of those he loves and cares? Why does the God who is all-powerful and all-good makes the people he loves and cares suffer? This is, or rather this was exactly the situation of the Jewish believers that were scattered across different regions during the time of James. James, the half-brother of Jesus. They were going through a lot as followers of Christ. You know, pressures uh, and persecutions from everywhere and everyone around them. As a result, the Jewish believers were discouraged and demoralized in their newfound faith in Jesus. And well, some of them began to even compromise their faith. And this is where James, the half-brother of Jesus, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote this letter. Wrote his letter to the Jewish believers to encourage them in their faith. And his key message was simply this. That God, sometimes God, does his best work, ironically, in the darkness of our trials. And so today... We are starting a new series entitled as Triumph Through Trials. Triumph Through Trials uh, from the book of James. Now, this series is not about telling us how to overcome trials in life, but rather how we triumph in our faith by, by going through the trials in life. Did you hear me? It is about how we triumph in our faith by going through the trials in life. And that is basically what the entire book of James is all about. James talked about the different aspects of, of our trials and challenges, you know, how, how our different aspects of our trials and challenges are avenues where we can and apply our faith so that it grows us over and through those difficult and challenging situations. So come, let us embark on this journey together through the book of James for the next four months. And I would say that you, you take this as an opportunity for yourself to really study and have a good grasp of the book of James, but more so, to know 
how you can grow your faith in Jesus through those difficult and challenging times you face in life. And let me tell you, here is how you can get the most out of this series. And that is this. Commit every week to reread and study the passage that is being preached on Sunday. All right? And ask yourself these questions. What is God speaking to me? How will I apply the truth that I learned on Sunday in my circumstances so that I can grow in my faith? And I would suggest, uh, talk about it in your small groups or in your mentoring groups or whatever group you have. Or just get someone to talk to and talk about it during the week in addition to your own personal reflection time. Brothers, sisters, do this if you want to get the most out of this series, all right? Now with that, let's begin the journey, shall we? But first, let me just pray for all of us, uh, for the Holy Spirit to just come and bless us. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, uh, we thank you. We thank you for preserving the scriptures for us. And, and right now, as we come before you, your presence, as we listen to your word, which is sharper than any double-edged sword that cuts between soul and spirit, uh, between joint and marrow. Come, Holy Spirit, expose our innermost thoughts and desires and direct and lead us to an everlasting path. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Trial is a school of faith. Trial is a school of faith. And whether we like it or not, <clears throat> whether we like it or not, all of us are enrolled in this school. In fact, we never get out of this school in this lifetime. And so uh, the best thing for us to do in this school of life is to be a student and not a victim. A victim would ask, why is this happening to me? While a student would ask, what is God teaching me? What do I have to learn from this? How can I pass this and go on to the next level or to the next thing? And in today's text, which is James chapter 1, Verses 2 to 4, James provides three things or three truths that will help us to be students and not victims in the school of faith. You know, to be a student that will pass the exams, uh, that will pass the test or difficult task or projects that come along the way of life. Here are the three truths or three things that will help us to achieve that, all right? And that is this, the command, the reason, and the reward. Three words to remember, command, reason, and reward. Let me unpack them one at a time. Are you ready? First, the command. Now, this is what James said in verse two. <clears throat> Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. James said, whenever. Whenever you face trials. So you see, this is, <laughs> that is why trial in your life is not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. That is why once you are born on this earth, by default, you get enrolled in this school of faith called trial. That is why, my brothers and sisters, my friends, you and I have absolutely no choice of what kind of trials come our way. But here's the good news. James tells us, as he told the Jewish believers then, 
he tells us even today that we have actually one choice. And that is this, that you and I have a choice to either be a student or be a victim. It's up to you. It's up to me. In other words, you and I, we can choose how we respond to trials in life. In fact, James commands, listen to this. In fact, James commands those who are Jesus followers to respond in a certain way, not in any how, not based on our feelings, but James commands all of us who are Jesus followers to respond in a certain way. Um, and, and Jesus followers would include all of us, you know, but in case you are watching this, you know, even maybe today you are here or during the week or you chance upon this video, you may say, oh, so that's, this is not for me, you know, because you may say, what if, oh, well, I don't consider myself as a Jesus follower. Can you apply what James commands? Well, the answer and the, and the good news is, yes, you can, my brother, my sister, if you're watching this. All right. So here's the command in this verse that when you face trials, when you face any trials in life, consider that as pure joy. Consider facing trials in life as something to be joyful about. Now, don't, don't go away, all right? Or don't switch channel. Stay on because James is going to tell us something that, that will just blow our minds, all right? In commenting this verse, Warren Worsby, I think, <clears throat> Many of us may know him. Warren Worsby uh, said this in commenting this verse. He said something like this. Our <clears throat> values determine our evaluations. How true is How true, right? So he gave an example. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. How true. And perhaps this is the situation for some of us, right? Because we value the material and the physical more than the spiritual. We, we value more what is happening on the outside rather than the inside of us. And therefore, discount it all joy when you face trials. Mm, doesn't speak to us. It's, 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 not, it's not something that is pleasing to our ears, right? And well, uh, he goes on to say this. If we live only for the present and forget about the future, that we have future, that the present is just temporary, but there is an eternal future, then the trials will make us bitter, not better. Is there anyone here today? You are feeling bitter. You're feeling bitter about life, about yourself, about God, about anything, everything because of the trials that you are going through. Well, brother, sister, probably you may be just living your life. You may be just thinking. You may be just living your life for the present and forgetting about the future. Now, Warren Worsby is correct, isn't it? Because, listen, this word the word that James used, the word consider, it has to do with our mindset, you know? It has to do with our outlook of life. It, it consider, this word consider has to do with a decision. It has to do with a decision to change or to adjust our perspectives. So you see what we value in life, our outlook in life, how we see and perceive things in in life has a great deal of determining how we live our lives or how our lives will turn out to be. And we know that, right? We know that. So here's what James is basically saying, that in the school of faith, in this school of faith that we are all enrolled in by default, trials will never stop coming in our lives. And so if we are serious about living our lives to the fullest as Jesus followers, then my brothers and sisters, we need a paradigm shift on how we view trials. 
And the paradigm shift is to view trials as something positive rather than negative. That is totally absurd, I know. I've been telling James, but he wouldn't listen. Oh, well, there is no way he would listen anyway. Well, I think when we go to heaven, I think he will, I think <clears throat> he will scold me. <laughs> like, what? You remember or not? You were preaching and then you were scolding me or you were like, you know. <laughs> well, I know it's totally absurd for many of us. But, well, brothers, sisters, that was exactly the command of James to the Jewish believers who were going through trials of different kind. And it is also the command for us today as well. Well, doesn't sound so encouraging, does it? I know it doesn't. But hey, here's the good news. Thankfully, thankfully, James doesn't leave us wondering about his absurd command to consider trials as an opportunity to be joyful about. And this leads us to the next point or the next truth. And that is this, the reason. <clears throat> the reason. James gives us the reason as to why we must consider or have a paradigm shift on how we view trials as something positive or as something to be joyful about. And the reason is found in verse 3, right? This is what he said in verse 3. Because, because, that's the reason, because you know that the testing of your faith produce perseverance. Now look at this. Brothers and sisters, look at this phrase, the testing of your faith. <laughs> Wait, what? The testing of your faith. What does that mean? Well, it simply means in this context that trials, James is basically saying that trials are like a test. And James is saying to the Jewish believers, you know that. This is not new. You already know. That is a testing. It's a test. These trials are a test. Well, what is a test? Or what, what is testing? Well, basically, testing is a process by which it reveals or proves the authenticity or the quality of something or someone, right? And in this context, James is saying that the trials we face in life is that the trial we face in life is like a test by which it reveals and it proves the authenticity or the quality of our faith in God. And here is how Spar, uh, Charles Spurgeon puts it. This is how he puts it. Trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil. And they let us see what we are made of. Oh, I love this. And isn't it true, brothers, sisters, who you are under pressure is what you really are. Let me say that again. Who we are under pressure is what we really are. And this also means that there are there are some things about you and about me and about our faith which we will never discover if not for some of the trials that we go through in life. Now, let me ask you, let me ask you, have you noticed yourself? Have you noticed yourself, uh, your response, your tone of voice, your posture, your demeanor, your look, your temperament? When you go through under pressure, when you go through tough times or difficult situation, when you are, for example, in sharp disagreement with someone and so on and so forth. Can you imagine? Can you picture yourself or can you recall how you behave or how you respond during those moments? And guess what? If you're honest to yourself, you should know, I should know, we should know how we behave, how we respond during those difficult moments, during those challenging and not nice moments with people. 
they expose and they reveal the actual person hidden inside you and me. That is what trials, that is what difficult situations will do for us, my brothers and sisters. It exposes the tr true you, the true me. In the words of Neil Maxwell, trials and tribulations tend to squeeze the artificiality out of us, leaving the essence of what we really are and clarifying what we really yearn for. And this is why trial, my brothers and sisters, is a school, is a spiritual school of faith. Because trial exposes the authenticity and the quality of our faith in God. There is no pretense of our faith before God when we face trials. No pretense. And I know you know. You see, in school, all right, and in school, I mean the physical school, all right, the actual school, the physical school where you go. In school, in physical school, you do all your learning through your weekly classes and lectures, right? I mean, even if you don't go to your physical school now because of COVID, you know, you still have HPL. You still do your learning from home, right? So you do all your learning through your weekly classes and lectures. But then there is a set aside day or week or weeks where all your learning will be put to test. And we call that what? The exam, <laughs> right? Whatever exam that is, but we call that exam. In the same way, in this spiritual school of faith that we are all in, we learn about God, about his character, his love, his mercy, his grace through our weekly Sunday service through our weekly Bible reading or Bible study or through our weekly uh, small group meetings and so on and so forth, right? And just as the physical school, in this spiritual school of faith, there is also a set aside date where all our learning of who God is will be put to test. And James calls that trial. And so since trial is a spiritual test of our faith in God, we must, my brothers and sisters, we must learn to ask the right question. And that is this. Are you ready? What must I do to pass the test? What must I do to pass the exam? Now, please, all of you stay muted, all right? Because I'm going to ask you to do something, but you stay muted, all right? If not, it's going to be very chaotic here. But why don't we try out together, just for fun's sake, indulge me in this one, all right? Everybody, on the count of three, let's say this out, all right? Let's ask this question to ourselves. Ready? On the count of three, okay? Let's ask as if we mean it, okay? Ready? One, two, three. What must I do to pass the test? That's right. Because trial is a test. And that's why I think we should ask, what must I do to pass the test? Perhaps some of us are right in the middle of a trial or just entered into some kind of trial. And if you pay close attention to yourself, your trial will reveal and expose the authenticity or the quality of your faith in God. And James is saying this to you, to me, that the same trial is an opportunity for you and for me to see the reality of our, the reality of our faith condition. And then leverage, James is saying this, leverage on that trial that you are facing to become better in applying your faith in God. That is why we need to start asking this question. What must I do to pass the test? And this, this will radically change the way we view our trials. But more importantly, this will radically change the way we stay through the trial. Because James 
said that the testing of our faith produces what? He said produces what? Perseverance. Now, what is perseverance? Well, perseverance is simply what? The tenacity or the ability to keep doing or to keep moving forward better under pressure, under stress. But listen, interestingly, perseverance is not the or the end goal of trials. In other words, the end goal or the reward for passing the test of faith through trials is not perseverance. It is not to make us patient Christians or Christians with high level of tolerance, although that is a good thing. In fact, listen to this one. Perseverance stands in between the reality of our trials and the reward of our trials. It is a means to an end and not an end in itself. Question is, what is it then, right? What is the end goal of trials? Which leads us to the third truth or third point, and that is this. The reward. The reward. In James uh, chapter 1, verse 4, in verse 4, he said this. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Watch this, the phrase. Let perseverance finish its work. Let it finish its work. In other words, James is saying this. Don't give up halfway. For if you do, you will not see what it can do for you. For instance, just as anyone who loves running. Who loves running, huh, by the way, here? I know. For sure. The, I think the guru of, you know, one who loves running. You know, and he doesn't mind running from the east to the west, you know, from one end of the world to the other end of the world. Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about or who I'm talking about. Of course, none other than my dear Pastor Hon, right? I mean, he loves running. And I think that's how he keeps himself fit, you know, uh, uh, not just physically, you know, but his physical, you know, as we all know, right, our physical is connected to our spiritual in case you don't know that, <laughs> you know, and that's why Pastor Hon is very spiritual, I tell you, all right? Ah, you don't know that, right? He's so spiritual because he keeps fit physically, all right? Oh, well, not completely true, but there's, there's, there's some truth in that, okay? When you keep <laughs> physically fit, you know, uh, in your spiritual aspect, it, it helps you as well, all right? But you see, just as anyone who loves running, they gain endurance and stamina to run long distance by suffering and by pushing himself through a, a, through a mile at a time. In other words, they don't end up running a long distance overnight, right? I'm sure Pastor Hon can testify to that. But you, you, you run one mile at a time and then you keep the momentum of running and you push yourself and you say, okay, today I will, I will go one more mile. And then you push and then like, wow, so pain everywhere. But you keep the momentum. And then the next week you push another mile. Following week, you push another mile. You keep going. And that's how you gain the momentum and you gain the endurance and the stamina to run long distance. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, we gain the ability to trust God more and more by suffering through trials. Each experience of the trial grants us, grants us the opportunity to trust God on a deeper level one at a time. So James is basically saying this, don't give up. Don't walk out of the examination hall halfway through your exam. Hang in there. Stay on. Let perseverance finish its work. But perseverance is not the end goal. Perseverance is not the reward. Instead, perseverance is the means to the reward. 
Because James said this, let perseverance finish its work so that, look at that phrase, so that, that is a purpose statement. So that, that what? So that what? You may be, look at that word again, mature and complete, not lacking anything. So that you may be mature and complete. Mature, complete, not lacking anything. What is James saying? Well, this is what James is saying. That spiritual maturity, that spiritual wholeness, that spiritual vitality, that spiritual stability, that is the reward for passing the test of faith by persevering on through the trials. What is this spiritual maturity? Or what is this spiritual completeness or wholeness? Let me show you three definitions of spiritual maturity or completeness or wholeness that James is talking about. Here's the first one. Spiritual maturity is marked by being comfortable with the unpredictability of God. I love this. That is spiritual maturity. Oh, this is news for some of us. I hope it is not. Spiritual maturity is not about how, 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 how deep your knowledge is about the word of God. It's not about memorizing. It's not about doing all the spiritual disciplines and getting everything right and getting all your theologies correct. But at the essence of spiritual maturity is really this. And this is what James is talking about that it is being comfortable with the unpredictability of God. <laughs> Similar to that, spiritual maturity is the capacity to endure uncertainty, not to escape uncertainty, but to endure the capacity, God-given capacity, and God has already given to us enough faith Enough capacity to endure. It's a matter of choice. It's a matter of deliberately making that choice to want to endure. And the third one, through spiritual maturity, you will see wiser ways to endure unavoidable hardships with grace and opportunities to turn your pain into lessons of service and healing for others. Let me ask you, my brothers and sisters, have you, <clears throat> have you seen anyone or, uh, or do you know of anyone who has gone through uh, intense trials one after another? And, and as a result, God just expands their faith muscles and increases the capacity to endure hardships with peace and joy still ex existing in their lives. Do you know of anyone? Have you seen, a, have you seen anyone like that? I, I know of this couple. Um, God blessed them with five children, uh, but their blessings also became their trials. Uh, because the first son, their first son had an accident uh, while he was a small baby. And so he became a special need uh, child due to the head injury during the accident. And then uh, their fourth child was a girl, but she had some kind of GDD. I think it's something like global developmental delay. And due to poor medical facilities and interventions, uh, she ended up becoming a special need child as well. And some eight or perhaps nine years ago, they had their first grandson, this couple. And they were overjoyed. But it became a nightmare when uh, their grandson became a victim, their first grandson became a victim of cerebral palsy, 
uh, due to, again, some negligence of the hospital uh, because of the poor facilities and, and so on and so forth. So you see, uh, altogether, three people, three in total, with special needs in their family circle. I think their son is about 46, 47 years old. The daughter is about 36, 37 years old. And their grandson is about 9, 10 years old. So you can say that this couple have been facing this trial for the past at least 46 years. And it only got intense with more added to the list. And brothers, sisters, they are still facing the trial even today. And it looks like they will never get out of this school of faith, really. Um, actually, this couple uh, brought their children, their son and the daughter, to many healing services, prayed like crazy, got the church to pray, went for a healing crusade where there were many people healed, but their children were never healed. And that's why I think it looks like they, were, they will never get out of this school of faith. Oh, wait, did I mention that one of their, uh, their daughter-in-laws had a miscarriage? It was a baby girl. That's right. They lost a granddaughter whom they never had the chance to meet, whom they never had a chance to cuddle, love, play with, cherish and see her grow. You know, sometimes I wonder, I truly wonder how they still believe and trust in the goodness of God. I really, I really do. I really wonder how they still keep up believing and trusting in the goodness of God with all that they have been through and still going through without any end. I mean, I have heard many stories about many people having great faith through trial. But this couple, boy, <laughs> I got to know them personally. In fact, I have seen them with my own eyes for the, the past 41 years, the supernatural, the supernatural capacity to endure hardships. I have seen their faith in God because coming more and more solid and steady over the course of facing trials after trials after trials. Such that today, can I tell you this? Today, nothing, absolutely nothing can deter them. Nothing can take away their confidence in God's love, God's grace, and God's mercy for them and their family. You go and ask them if you don't believe me. Do you think God loves you? God loves your family more than anything else? You will have a resounding answer. Yes. Now, in case you're wondering how I know this couple for the past 41 years, well, it's because they are my parents. That's right. They are my parents. Do you know what I learned um, from the trials of my parents, uh, my family. I mean, I, I learned a lot. I, I don't think I would be where I am today or more specifically, I don't think I would be handling my own trials the way I am doing today without seeing them grow the way they grew with our family trials. So there are many lessons that I learned, but one thing that really came so strong, especially when I was studying this passage, is this. That it was not the triumph, it was not the triumph over trials that grew us, that grew our family spiritually, really. Well, in the first place, the truth is that we never did overcome our trials. So yes, never had the opportunity to grow that way. I don't know if anyone grew that way, but we never had the opportunity to grow that way, overcoming trials. In 
Instead, we grew spiritually by going through the trials together as a family, by going through the trials and learning to trust in the goodness of God one at a time, even though at many times it didn't make sense. But we asked, if not Jesus, who? If not trust God, trust who? So there was a deliberate choice on choosing to trust God even when it didn't make sense. And boy, that was what I saw from my parents. One trial at a time. One trial at a time. Yes, it was going through, not avoiding it. Yeah, going through the trials, those unexpected, unwelcome, and unwanted trials. It was going through the trials and in the midst of that, deliberately choosing to trust in the goodness of God. That, my brothers and sisters, that somehow expanded and stretched the faith muscles of my family members. Brothers and sisters, I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that because, just because my parents, my family experienced spiritual maturity by going through trials, you too can experience that. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that that is the basis. No, that's not the basis. The basis is God. The basis is who God is. The basis is that God is faithful. You may not think so, but he is. The basis is that God is good. You may not think so, but he is. The basis is that he loves you more than you can ever imagine. That is the basis that you too can experience spiritual maturity, not by avoiding, but by going th through the trials. And I like this article, how it puts it, what I'm saying, all right? So let me just show you. Because of God's nature, because of who God is and his loving relationship with us. Watch this. Randomness is transformed to intentionality. It becomes intentional for God to work something for us. Watch this. Destructive events and circumstances where we cry out, where it's like it just frustrates us, they become formative and transformational because of who God is. Not because of what we can do, but because of the goodness and the faithfulness and his love and his goodness. It's not ended yet. Watch this. Because of who God is, hopelessness loses its lessness suffix. I love this part. Hopelessness loses its lessness suffix. And the apparent judgment is rightly seen as loving discipline. This is not really a fresh perspective on our trials, but simply the accurate one. Listen to this. This is not really a fresh perspective on our trials, brothers, sisters, but this is the accurate perspective because of who God is. So take heart in his goodness, in his loving kindness, in his love that is fully lavished for you and for me through his only son, Jesus. And because of that, brothers, sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, would you consider it pure joy? And for some of you right now, you are in the midst of it. You, are, you want to give up because there is no end. There is no end because we never get out of this school of faith. So consider it as something to be joyful about because it is a test of your faith in God. 
God is allowing it to test your faith in Him. And listen, if God is allowing it, you can be sure of, you can bet your life that He will never leave you alone, even when you feel lonely. So ask, ask the question, what must I do, therefore? What must I do to pass the test? What must I do? What must you do, brother, sister? to pass the test that you are going through right now. And as you struggle along, it will produce the spiritual stamina for you to keep going on, to keep trusting God on a deeper level in each trial you face. We will never get out of this school. And precisely because of that, we have the opportunity to expand and grow our faith in God. So, don't walk away. Don't walk out of the examination hall halfway through your test. Deliberately choose to trust in God and in, in His love for you. And sooner or later, my brothers, my sisters, you will see that your trials, that your heartaches, that the rain and the storm in your life are somewhat and actually will turn out to be God's blessings because they are and they may be and James is telling us they are God's blessings in disguise. Amen. So I hope you will stay encouraged with that. And just for you to respond, I'd like to now uh, share this song, uh, which I think many of us have already heard. Um, Blessings by Laura's story. Just sums up what we have talked about. So I'll ask uh, Ising to play the song. And as uh, we listen, you may want to sing. If not, just listen. And would you just respond in your heart as you listen to this song?